That's right, a $199 3D printer from the same company who makes $17,000 industrial 3D printers. This is the JG Maker R1, and it is probably the best entry-level 3D printer on the market right now, sub $200. And we're going to take a look, and we're going to go over everything. Here we go. Now, when I say $199, right, so listed on the website, I think it's listed at $249 or $259, but there is a coupon code called JGMAKER60, which makes it $199 right now. And I think maybe I put $199 on the screen the whole time, but as I go through this machine, I want you to pay attention to the features that I'm talking about, and I want you to keep that $199 number in your head the whole time because we're seeing 3D printers change in this industry and people talk about a race to the bottom. Well, it's not necessarily a race to the bottom with, with quality or functionality and features and price. What we're seeing is all of the traditionally higher end features on bed slingers, we're seeing those come down to now where these are on machines at $199. This means that this proven technology, this bed slinging technology is going to be loaded at an extremely affordable price, especially for beginners and people coming into the 3D printing industry and printing for the first time. The first thing that people do when they jump into 3D printing is they normally have a budget. They pick a printer or a model or a set of printers uh, based on that budget and you know, 200 or 400 or 600 or 1,000. And then from there, they kind of try and find the printer within that budget range that has the most amount of features or the biggest build plate, things like that. The JG Maker R1 has a very common build volume. It's about 230 by 230 by 250 millimeters on the Z, which puts it at about nine inches by nine inches by just shy of about 10 inches tall, which it's a pretty common build size. It's gonna be able to handle anything that you throw at it. Um, you can make helmets on it. You just have to slice them up. But for the most part, this is the most common size in the 3D printing industry. It has a direct drive hot end. And what that means is, is that means that the extruder gears that actually drive the filament are in the same assembly as the hot end, which actually melts the filament. It's an all metal hot end and it can handle temperatures up to 260 C on the hot end, which will allow you to print things like PLAs, uh, ABSs, ASAs, PETGs, uh, even TPUs, flexible filaments, things like that. You won't be able to print nylon on a, on the machine like this um, unless you find some sort of a really light nylon blend that prints at a much lower temperature. But I think for the most part, that's not what you're looking at. If you're getting into an entry level 3D printer, you're not going to be printing those crazy exotic filaments. And I would say that uh, probably a very small percentage of our industry prints in nylon. Most people are printing in PLAs, they're printing in PETGs. Uh, TPUs like flexible stuff, and that's that's what they're printing. Uh, you might print an ABS and ASA and experiment there, uh, but you'd probably want to put the printer in an enclosure if you're going to do that anyway. It comes with an MK8 brass nozzle, and after we go over all of these features here shortly, there's just one thing that stood out is something that I would change if I picked up this machine, and that would be I would change out the nozzle. So brass nozzles are just soft, and if you use them with glow-in-the-dark filaments or other types of abrasive filaments like PLAs with carbon fiber or things like that, you're going to end up having to replace that nozzle because those are just abrasive materials and brass being so soft, um, it'll just eat those nozzles up. But what I would recommend for this particular machine is, is uh, MicroSwiss, which happens to be a fantastic sponsor of our show and this content, and they offer a CM2 nozzle in an MK8 style, and they're not too expensive, and we'll have a link on the screen in the description below, but that would be the only upgrade that I think that would do to this machine. Um, other than that, it's fully loaded. It prints at a decent speed of about 180 millimeters per second on the high end. And uh, I think I've got this one set to about 100 millimeters per second maximum on a few things. And right now it's printing that Mark Rober blaster, the uh, Nerf blaster right here, the compliant mechanism. And uh, it's printing that, and I think it's max speed is gonna be about 100, and, or 100, 120 millimeters per second. It has a double-sided PEI flexible magnetic sheet, which is, like I said, these are higher end features that you traditionally don't see on a machine uh, sub $200. It has power loss recovery mode, which ends up being a really great feature. If you trip over the power cord or if the power goes out, as soon as the power returns, it'll resume exactly where it left off. The R1 is equipped with a 32-bit silent motherboard. And what that means is, is that there's a little bit more headroom for doing calculations. The machine's not gonna pause when things get complicated. Um, and it's also really quiet. Hear it? It's running right next to me while we're filming. And I don't, I don't think you can hear it. I mean, it's very silent here. The only thing I can hear is I can actually hear the power supply fan. That's about it. Hey, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and ring that bell. We're a small channel and we're growing and it helps us out a lot.
The R1 has X and Y belt tensioners, which is normally a feature that's reserved for a little bit higher end machines. Um, but the X and Y axis are driven by belts. And so these little knobs right here will actually help you tighten those or keep those tuned to maintain the print quality. The hot end assembly has dual parts cooling fans, which is kind of nice. And so if you don't know exactly why that's important, if you have one single side cooled and let's say you're running a, a, a pumpkin or something like that, and if you only have one fan blowing across the part to cool, and let's say it's going in a counterclockwise motion, every time it comes around on the far side of that print, you're gonna end up with a problem where the air from the cooling duct can't reach that other side. So your near side and your far side, the prints will actually look different because the airflow is significantly different. On one side, it could cool adequately, the other side, it couldn't. This machine has dual part cooling fans, which means it's getting an even amount of air blowing on both sides, and effectively you'll get that symmetry uh, in airflow when you're printing. The Z is driven by dual Z motors, which is kind of nice. I know that there's some people that are divided there where some people think that dual Z uh, motors are essential. Other people think that uh, one is fine, but ultimately it's dual Z with a belt at the top. That's just going to allow the gantry to be lifted uh, evenly um, as you're printing. So um, I don't think it's a bad thing to have dual Z. Um, is it a benefit? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say yes, but other people might say no. But ultimately, regardless, it's an upgraded feature that you'll only see on higher end machines. One particular feature I think that a lot of people on the sub $200 3D printer models are accustomed to not having is automatic bed leveling. They're used to having knobs under here to actually tighten the bed uh, in different places and, and level it out and tram it out. So that's a fantastic feature that you normally see on higher end machines and they've trickled down to this sub $200 machine and it's a fantastic feature. It's gonna be great for beginners, great for novices. You don't have to mess with knobs. You don't have to understand how that works. You're just gonna start your print and you're good to go. Traditionally on a machine this cheap, you're gonna have a much cheaper interface. This actually has a really nice 4.3 inch touchscreen display. The only negative that I would give on this particular display is that it's extremely sensitive. Like, I mean, like, I feel like your finger doesn't even touch it and it's already responding. And we were told by a member of our 3D printing community that there is an update that actually lessens that sensitivity. I mean, it's not like it's a deal breaker or anything, but it's just, just know that you almost aren't even touching it and it's responding. Oh, and I do have one other complaint about the interface, that the home screen actually doesn't give you any status. It doesn't tell you the temperatures or anything like that that's running on the machine from the home screen. And that's something that uh, maybe JG Maker can, can fix in an update. The build plate has a maximum temperature of about 100 C, which is adequate for anything that you're gonna be able to print, especially with the hot end that goes up to 260 C. Matter of fact, it might even be overkill. They probably didn't even have to go to 100 C, but I think that's just pretty standard. So again, you're gonna be able to print all of your PLAs, your PTGs, your TPUs, uh, ABSs, ASAs, things like that. You're gonna be able to print those just fine on this machine. I didn't end up using the Cura slicer that uh, is preferred with this particular machine. I'm just not a fan of Cura, and that's just a that's just a preference. Um, I did create a profile inside of Prusa Slicer, and I had to set the extrusion multiplier to uh, 0.92. 0.91 or 0.92 in any way, and that's what gave me the perfect fit. Um, I thought it actually, where's it at? Oh, here it is, hang on. Got it. This is basically, a, it's an extrusion test that allows you to, and I'll hold that up right there. It's just a little key shaped piece, and I'll have some B-roll of it. What this allows you to do is actually get the perfect extrusion multiplier. So if the two pieces fit together and there's no slop, right, there's no wiggle, then it's perfect. If you can slip it on without any force, just kind of put it on there, and let go and it holds it, then it's absolutely perfect. If there's slop and it falls off or you have to push it on, uh, then that would mean that you're over extruding. Um, but if there's slop, then you're under extruding. And so that's exactly what I used inside Prusa Slicer to get that perfect extrusion multiplier. And so far, I think it's fantastic. It turned out really, really, really nice. It's equipped with a filament runout sensor, which these are fantastic devices. They basically are gonna prevent you from having a failed print when you ultimately run out of filament. Um, the sensor is just really basic. It's gonna sense whether there's filament in there or not. And eventually, if it pulls the filament through, it tells the printer we're out of filament, it pauses the print, it allows you to reload and then resume. It uses a full-size SD card, which is kind of nice, right? Um, it also has a little tool tray right there in the front. I don't really use the tool tray. Oh, actually, I do use the tool tray. That's where I kind of keep the spare nozzles and maybe the tools that came with it. Now, it does take two spools up top. Obviously, it can only run one spool at a time. But the little addition that uh, turns in here, that cams in here, is actually on the SD card and you can print that. So I think that this 3D printer is basically going to be for anyone. Anybody who can turn a screwdriver, anybody that can read a little manual is going to be able to put it together in, in no time, in no trouble. Now, what about the overall finish of the machine? 
I'm really liking when they take these machines and they're all completed with panels and injection molding. They just make them feel much more like finished appliances or finished products. Uh, and the graphics are kind of cool. I like how they're kind of doing that. They're giving printers, they're giving 3D printers some class, some character. I like it. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm missing. I, I don't think so. For someone who has a budget of $200, if that's your budget, that's your budget. And we always hear people go, well, my budget's $200. And someone comes along and offers a $300 printer. And I, I understand budgets. If your budget is $200, then that's all it is. It's $200. It's no more. That's why I really think that having a loaded machine like this from JG Maker was incredibly brilliant because it's going to be this type of feature packed machine. It's going to be a machine that people have a relatively high level of success with, but at $199. I can't think of another machine that comes in with this price point, this build volume, and all of these features. I just can't. It's pretty incredible. Let me give a big thank you to JG Maker. Thank you so much for sending the machine over. We appreciate it and giving us an opportunity to play with it and to share it with everyone. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this content. If you'd like more information on the R1, it'll be on the screen or in the description below. But I also want to give a big shout out to our YouTube members. If you'd like your name included in every single one of our videos, reach down there. Press that join button. We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Teal, 3D Pathfinder, Dave Frizzell, JD Davis, Jesse West, Four Pipes, David Kwashnick, Waste and Time, VPS Data, Captain Jerbear91, Sir Will 3D, Joel Finn, Brandon 0109, Cam Nicholas, Lep E, Leptonium, The Cinzia, Patrick W3D, Rip Artist, Breedog Knight, Cetral, Your Buddy Nanak, Buddha 3D, and Jedi Spidey. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next one.